Welcome to the Catbird Quilts. I'm Kathy Martin, and I thought maybe it might be helpful to get inside my head for a little bit and show you projects I'm considering for a wedding quilt gift that's gonna be coming up before long. So climb inside my head and here we go. I have a friend named Amy who was a teenager when I met her and she was in our youth group at church and we love Amy. And in fact, Amy has stayed a part of our life for, gosh, many years now, even traveling to Nebraska to visit us when we moved out there. And so now she's not a kid anymore. She's a grown woman, beautiful, wonderful, funny, easygoing woman who got married last May. But I wanted to uh, make her a wedding quilt and uh, life got a hold of me as it oft does. And so it's been in my mind ever since, but I haven't really been in a place where I could actively consider what I would do. And so now I'm in this place, I'm not quite on the backside of the Christmas quilt that I'm working on. Yes, it's January. And I'm in the middle of my nine patch trip around the world quilt. And I'm in that place, and if you have been quilting for any time at all, you know the place I'm about to describe. I have gotten all of my colors and fabrics and patterns together for the two quilts that I'm working on, and now I'm in a place where I'm kind of just doing the mechanics of the piecing. So I'm just sewing blocks together, and then sewing those blocks together, and then sewing those blocks together, and that can be its own zen for sure and really enjoyable sometimes especially if have had a very um, busy or challenging work week just to kind of zone out and sew but it can get tedious and it can get um, repetitive and especially with my trip around the world quilt it's it's nine patch blocks it's just and then it's more nine patch blocks and then it's more nine patch blocks and so it's not as um rewarding mentally as it is just it's kind of the production mode so this is where chain piecing comes in and this is why a lot of people do those strip sewing to then make nine patches because it's like you just kind of are getting the work done. It's easy to get to this place, and I'm kind of in this place in two separate quilts, where the love for the project is what's carrying you and or carrying me. But the getting it done is uh, it's just a little bit of a doing the same thing again and again. And so I don't know if it's wandering eyes or, and I've referenced this before, it's like your mind kind of starts drifting to the next project because the next project and the idea of them and considering fabrics and patterns is a little more appealing and a little more um, enjoyable and gives you that dopamine release that maybe sewing nine patch blocks together does not. So. But the, the good side to that is that thinking of the next project a lot of times gives me the motivation for the current project that I have so that I'll go on and get rolling on it and get it finished so that I can get started on the next one. But there's a lot of buts in this. <laughs> I, I shudder to think what caption or picture might come up when I just said there are a lot of buts in this. Picking a pattern and considering a new project is so much fun, but it's also can be very overwhelming. A lot of us love this part, and I am one of these people who loves this part. So Amy and her wedding is where I wanted to go with my next project. And I was talking to my friend Jennifer. I'm going to start calling, I, I say my friend Jennifer so often, I think I'm just going to start saying MFJ. And you all will know, MFJ, my friend Jennifer. We were talking on the phone about making a gift for someone, especially something like a wedding gift. And 
it's so fun and so great and also so challenging because if what I was thinking is I might do a quilt based on the colors that were in her wedding. So her bridesmaids dresses and her flowers and her cake all had this same color palette. And it was really, really beautiful and interesting. I have had a pattern in my PDFs, my, my quilt pattern file on my computer, all these PDFs, um, and it's growing. And I never thought that I would have <laughs> multiple quilt patterns, like more than I can probably do. But it is, there's a quilt that I've been considering and it's called Blizzard by Katie Spain. It might be Kate Spain. Let me check. Hang on, it's on my computer. And she has it as a color, like multiple colors. And then there's a two-tone one. And the two-tone one was the one that I saw. And I thought, oh, that is so, so lovely. And I have, I bought the pattern and I looked at the fabric requirements and nearly fell out because it's a lot of yardage. And the way the pattern is designed, they are very big blocks. And so the piecing is actually fairly large. We'll get a picture of it, hopefully, and it will probably appear magically <laughs> right here beside me. So you know what I'm talking about. Um, and a lot of times quilt patterns that have big blocks and big piecing don't actually work really well for shirt fabrics because you only have the one shirt. And it might only really cover one block or maybe two at best. And so I have loved it and I have wanted to make it, but I have wanted to really continue to incorporate my shirt fabrics into my quilts. And so I kind of put it on the shelf. And then about three weeks ago, or maybe four, I saw this quilt pattern by Kitchen Table Quilting, Erica Jackman. And I love her quilt patterns so much. And she has a new, newish one called the Melody Quilt Pattern. And it is really pretty. It, it almost looks like it has like a windmill kind of, you know, they come together at the point. And it has a lot of movement to it. If you look at the picture of the quilt, I realize it's flat, but it just feels like there's some fluidity or movement to it. It looks like they could start turning at any moment. And that's a really lovely thing to have in a quilt is something that has that feel of dynamic movement as opposed to just a static, flat, somewhat uninteresting design. So I was just entertaining thoughts of both of these quilts and then realized that I probably need to start actively thinking about what I want to make for Amy. The Melody quilt is a more multicolored uh, quilt pattern. And so I started there. I had Amy send me, she does not know I'm making this quilt, by the way. <laughs> I had her send me pictures of her bridesmaids, her cake, her flowers, um, she sent me a lot of pictures. It was fantastic. And it's such an interesting color palette. So, um, but as usual, you know, when you're trying to, it's like you want to match, but it doesn't have to be matchy. Um, that's, that's what I did. So I sat down in my floor, literally just like this with my, I actually had all of my totes out. Um, and I just started pulling fabric. So I have this orange linen that I have referenced a number of times. I actually have multiple orange linens. This one is a little bit in the terracotta family. It's less orange orange and has a little bit of undertone of peach. There is a bridesmaid that had almost this identical dress. Um, this persimmon Oxford cloth, which I, I guess I'm really enamored with it because it just keeps coming up these days. And then there's this one, which was not exactly in her color palette. It was close. Um, it, to me, this is like the perfect color lipstick. I wonder if it actually it might be very close to the lipstick I have on right now, <laughs> actually. But it was, an, it was a nice blend with these two. And then a couple of her bridesmaids had dresses that were in the gray-green family. And then I was, as I was looking at her flowers, 
the foliage in the flowers is actually this sage color. And I happen to have a lot of it. I don't know if you ever saw the how I break down my shirts. This was the gigantic shirt that I broke down and I haven't used it yet. And it, I think the the foliage in the in her floral arrangements really pulled that. And because it is a very muted sage, it's kind of a grayish sage to begin with. I thought that would really work. One of her bridesmaids had on a teal dress. Oh, so gorgeous. And it's, it's like between these two. This is a shirt. This is just a fat quarter that I have that they call China blue. Um, and it, this is too vibrant. This is too green. So I kind of mm, was back and forth about that. Um, this palish blue gray was actually what I considered initially in place of that sage. Um, but it was a little, it's a little too blue. So I kind of threw that out. Um, one of her bridesmaids had on a really peach dress. I'm still debating about this one. I have this peach, which has some other colors informing it. And then I have this one, which is, a, you probably can't see it. It's a plaid, but it's very fine. But it reads kind of this color, which is a very pale pink. So mm, her cake had some flowers in it. And as flowers are wont to do, they're maybe this color at the center and this color at the edge. So I'm in debate about that. And then there was a actually surprisingly vibrant light blue in her flower arrangements. And so that seemed to continue on in a way that looked nice. Look at that. That's actually really pretty. Um, and it really works with the sage, although I would not have thought that it would because one is very muted and one is not very muted, but it did kind of work. And at the center of one of her flowers was a, it was a dark blue slash black. And so I pulled that navy that has the teeny tiny little white polka dots. I mean, little blue polka dots. And that was nice. So then all of a sudden now this is what we're looking at is this, which is really, really, really pretty since I didn't have the teal that I wanted or needed. And this is one of the things about considering projects. A lot of times you have, you start getting an idea, you start forming a, a sense of what this could look like. And you're, you have a gap, like there's something missing. And I can do one of two things. I can decide that I'm going to actually leave that gap there, which can add some interest actually like, oh, where's the teal? Or you can go a different direction, which is what I actually did in consideration of this. And I looked back at the flowers again. The flowers were helpful. And the underside of the sage flowers were actually this forest green. And so then I added that in. So this the underside of the sage flowers and some of the other foliage was this kind of actually dark green that's not in that teal family. It's actually kind of very muted and um, almost in the yellow family, which is kind of interesting. Got to right here, um, she did not have any of this color that I'm about to pull, which is this butter, it's buttery is what it is. <laughs> this shirt is buttery soft. Have you ever heard that buttery soft? That's what this is. And it's the color of butter. And if you can see that, that actually, I mean, I'm not going for a rainbow, but it really does um, tie that in. I'm on the fence about it. And I have a plaid that would tie it in nicely, this one. Um, and so that could be a really nice blender. You can see that. And even further on, that's really lovely. And then this is really lovely. And then we know it works with the blue because it's got a big blue stripe in it. So um, so all of that is great, although uh, because she didn't really have yellow in her bridesmaid's dresses or in her flowers, as brides are wont to do, had a 
really pretty wedding cake. And you know, buttercream icing is not white white. It's kind of a off white. So I have this one, um, which also works and is actually truer to the colors of the wedding. And then I have this cream that's not, a, it is in the yellowish family, but not yellow. And I'm, I'm kind of leaning that direction because I think that is actually really, that was m actually much closer um, to what was really in the wedding. Going back to the original quilt pattern, which is Blizzard by Kate Spain, and I have been accumulating white linen um, because I, I've been accumulating linen is what I've been accumulating. And I found a pair of white linen capris, and there is a lot of fabric in a pair of pants, P.S. So I'm not just a shirt girl, also a thrift store pants girl. And I realized I'm starting to have enough white linen to maybe do that two-tone quilt. And so I have two or three shirts. I have one shirt already broken down. I have this pair of pants that's probably every bit of probably a yard and a half, maybe as much as two. And I think I checked the fabric requirements and I think it's something crazy like four and a half yards, uh, which that's not actually crazy for a quilt, but um, it's it felt like a lot to me. Yeah, it's four and a half yards of fabric to do the blocks if you do them two-tone, which is very hard to accomplish in shirts uh, unless you're creative and unless you're accumulating uh, linen. <laughs> and the thing about linen is it is, oh my, well, I mean, I just need to not go on, but it's heavy. And so it breathes and it washes well and you can wash it and dry it on hot and it crinkles up and it has that nice weight. And so I was like, okay, what if I totally put this aside, that idea of the Melody quilt from Kitchen Table Quilting and did the, oh my goodness, that is beautiful and would make a glorious quilt. But what if we went the timeless route and did just a two-tone. So I wanted to show you that. I have not made a decision, actually. Um, so if you want to weigh in <laughs> with your opinion about what I should do, I'm open. Don't get married to it, though, because I might change it all up and do neither of these. I started with the idea that obviously one of the two-tones, well, maybe not obviously, one of the two-tones would be white. And I have this, um, this is that grayish. It's kind of gray, kind of tan, kind of beige. Um, it's a yard. I bought this on sale at my local quilt store and I loved it. Then I'm like, I will need more of it and I will have to go buy more of it. And they may not have this anymore because it was one of those clearance sale. And then same with this, that could actually be really pretty. It's a significantly darker, kind of same, really same feel. Just this one would be darker. And I decided, meh. So then I started pulling up my gray shirts, and I think with that quilt pattern, because it's very big blocks and they're alternating. So one is, like in this case, the gray is the background and the white is the flower. And then the next block over, the white is the background and the gray would be the flower. So I feel pretty certain that if I could find, or if I have, some grays, I can do like the, the grays that are the background, those can be one shirt. And then the grays that are the foreground or the flower, that can be another shirt. So I pulled out a couple of shirts. I really like this one. It's just that great neutral gray and it has kind of an interesting, there's a fine white line in it with a little, it almost looks like a pick where they pulled that white up through, but it's, uniform throughout. So it was a plan. <laughs> and it has, so it has a subtle print, which would give some variety uh, and also some texture. And then I found this shirt, which is remarkably close in color. Um, not exact, but close. And this one has a little bit 
darker flowers and then a little bit lighter. Actually, these, almost these colors for the flowers on it. And I thought that could be lovely. So I'm throwing that idea around that that could be really, really pretty and it would be gray and white. Gray and white and tan and white are good, I think, if you're going neutral, because almost everybody can make that work in their decor. Um, Amy is a really au natural girl. She does a lot of, like when she comes over to visit, she'll have her hair pulled up in a messy bun, no makeup on. She'll have on hiking shorts and chacos or tevas and, you know, hiking sandals and her water bottle. And if we have food out, she's going to have some of it. But she just really has that like I don't know. She just she just seems really earthy, kind of down to earth person. So I started throwing around the idea: what if I went tan, in, or it's not really beige, not really tan, but anyway, instead of gray. And so I, you know, of course, dug through my stash. Which, by the way, I should probably stop and point out that some of these are shirts that are broken down already into what look like fat quarters. But when I start consider, seriously considering a quilt pattern, I get out my shirts as well because that's the whole point of having them. Sometimes I haven't gotten them broken down, but I want them to be available as choices. That's why I have the whole shirt. That's not really the way I would like to choose fabric, but it works for me. And so I get my fabric, I get my tote of shirts and I pull that out. So sometimes I'm shopping my shirts and sometimes I'm shopping so it's like I'm shopping my shirt stash and I'm shopping my fabric stash, but it's all the same. And then once I pick, I will break down the shirt or shirts that I need. So I started digging through my shirt stash, obviously, and I found this linen shirt that is that really just good. I mean, really, if I called that a color, I would call that linen. And then I found the other day a pair of linen pants. This is a very heavy linen. I love it. And they're pretty close. They're not identical, but they're remarkably close. And then I had, this was actually, this was my very own skirt and it was unflattering. And so I decided I would just take it apart. So I have all of these pieces. Um, they need to be ironed and whatever, but there's more there. So it's a little bit lighter. If I got in a pinch, I could probably make it work. There's a center center square turned on it. So a center diamond in each flower. And so if I needed to, I could use that as the center if I was starting to run out of fabric, which is one of the things you have to think about when you use shirts and upcycled clothes and sheets and towels, <laughs> not towels, linens, because you're, you know, it may say four and a half yards of fabric, but I'm not cutting these big swaths off the bolt. And so sometimes I can get more, for example, out of this pair of pants and I won't have as much waste, which I really like. I like that. It's a little more work and I have to be a little more thoughtful about my cutting. And so a lot of times what I'll do is I'll start with how many pieces of this size do I need and I'll work backward from there. Um, but I think that could be Actually, oh my goodness, linen. But anyway, that, I think that would be really pretty. And it's the sort of thing that I think would be very timeless and will look good in any bedroom, anywhere. If they move all over the country and out of the country and back, a white and beige quilt um, might always work for them. So that's what I'm thinking about. I am... Um, I just want to encourage you, if you're a new quilter and you're in your current project and you're starting to lose steam on it and you're thinking about your next project, that's so normal. <laughs> that is so normal and good in its own way, as long as you can make that work. Now, some people get their next project and they don't finish the one they're on. And I actually have, I have an unfinished project right now that is kind of a source of frustration for me. But so there is, it's a you, trying to find that balance between letting the new project help propel you through where you are and give you the next thing to look forward to without losing energy on this thing. Um, 
but that's great. It's like, I've told this story before when I went to, went to the quilt store, quilt fabric store the first time and I was working on my very first quilt, she said, the she being the clerk at the <laughs> quilt store, she said, have you come up with your next 12 quilts yet? <laughs> and I, I mean, I already had two in the pipeline in my mind. And so that is, that is a quilter's thought process, I think. So I just wanted to let you in on my thoughts and ideas. I just realized I didn't talk about this micro gingham that I have that matches up nicely. So if I got in a pinch and couldn't find any more linen and ran out, I have that. Um, sorry, that was an aside, but it was right there and I could not pass it up. <laughs> Can't leave well enough alone. So I'm, I'm not totally convinced either way. I think both could be beautiful. I think she will, she would love the um, Melody quilt now. And she would love both of them now. And I think most brides really are so grateful for everything they get. But we've all had the experience where someone has put a lot of work and effort and love and time into a gift. And it is very meaningful, but we might not like it or it might not suit our um, aesthetic. And that's always tricky because if you've ever been given a quilt that you didn't just love, but you know you should love it, then what do you do with it? Does it go in a closet? Does it get put on a bed in a spare room? And I know those of us that are quilters, none of us want that. We want to, we want to give a quilt and the person love it and use it and wear it out. And so that's, I think, why I have these thoughts and why I can't land yet, because I, I want her to, I want her to have something that she loves, and I also want it to be timeless and meaningful. So that's my wedding quilt project that will be, it's not yet. Again, if you're interested in your, in putting your thoughts in the comments, I love to read the comments. I read every one of them. I'm getting to the place where I'm running out of time in my day to be able to respond to all of them. So please know that I read them and I love them. I may not always respond to everyone, um, but I'm, I'm grateful that you're here with me. I appreciate your time and attention. And um, yeah, so that's that. I'm Kathy Martin, and this is the Catbird Quilts. Thanks so much for watching.